everybody. We only have an hour of Carl Rove's time, and we'd like to make the most of it. I'm very lucky to have Carl Rove with us this morning. Um, thank you very much as a conservative for integrating the uh, speaker lineup. Um, I'm, I'm happy to spend time in, in Aspen, the Moscow in the mountains. <laughs> After all, I live in Austin, which is Moscow on the Little Colorado. But, uh. um, everybody knows who Karl Rove is. Um, he's been active in national politics now for 43 years, since you were in high school, I think. Um, and has won scores of races, lost a few, most notably two gubernatorial campaigns for, on, the, on the victory side. Um, George Bush's two wins in... Um, the state of Texas and his two presidential races, George Bush calls him the architect. He is now a Wall Street Journal columnist and author, Fox News commentator, uh, and he's a co-founder of American Crossroads and uh, Crossroads GPS, its affiliate. I saw you're supposed to do a panel at nine on the future of the GOP, uh, which kind of boxes us in and leaves us with the potentially slightly more awkward no, no, let, let's, expl let's explore it GOP. here because then I won't have to say much in the next panel. <laughs> I mean, I could just sort of slumber with my eyes open or something. Well, and I'd, I, I would like to, we'll talk a little bit about the recent past, pivot to the future and the question of how you hope to, would hope to broaden the base of the party. Um, I'm going to take the first few questions and then I'm going to open it up to you guys. This is the kind of subject, um, American politics, that lends itself to long arguments and speech making. I really ask you to please ask a question when you get um, your turn at the mic. Uh, we'd like to maximize our, our time for Carl Rove to, for all of us to hear from Carl Rove. That's the longest speech I intend to give myself and uh, would like to get started. And I, I would like to start with a question of, how it was your own expectations were so confounded yeah. in this last cycle. You wrote, um, on the eve of the election, and you were more cautious than some in making predictions, but in the journal you wrote, my prediction, sometime after the cock crows on the morning of November 7th, Mitt Romney will be declared America's 45th president, let's call it 5148, with Mr. Romney carrying at least 279 electoral college votes, probably more. It was 51-47 the other way, and Mitt Romney won 206 electoral votes yep. to Barack Obama's 332. So Thank you for bringing back up this painful moment. <laughs> like I said, it's just the way they, they laid out the agenda. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so why did you get it wrong? Uh, first of all, I thought that at the end of the day, uh, in the, the rule is tip typically in a presidential race, a president's number is a president's number. So if a president is at 49%, he's stuck at 49%. Which he was going into. Which he was. In fact, I, uh, I knew you'd bring this, so I, I brought my fi final map. Now, I don't have the color version, but, but I'll, I'll, this, cap this captured every state correctly except one. It has Florida within the margin of error, but it has it, the last range of public polls the last week had Florida with a positive Romney number. But all of these close states, Florida, Ohio, Virginia, had tended to have Obama numbers at 49, which would suggest that um, that's where he'd be stuck, because that's what typically happens. Uh, going into the 2004 presidential election, we were stuck nationally at 51, and 51 was what we got. The undecided simply tend not to break towards the incumbent. But this election was an unusual election. First of all, President Obama is only the second American president to win re-election with a smaller percentage of the vote. Uh, the only other time it happened was 1832 when we had the um, first equivalent of the Tea Party, the anti-Masonic Party grew and took enough of the vote in the North that uh, I think Jackson gets one-tenth of a percent less. President Obama got a couple, nearly a couple of points less. He's also the first president, and this is the thing that astounds me, the first president to win re-election with a smaller number of votes. Now, we don't really know. There, no, the experts don't agree on how many votes. I was looking at this this morning. Uh, we still don't know how many people actually voted in this election. We, here we are this long afterwards. The Census Bureau just came out with a report this week saying 132.9 million, 132,948,000 people voted. 
But if you add up the votes, depending on how you add them up, the numbers between 129,069,000 and 129,154,000. And yet, four years ago, it was 131 million plus. So we had an election in which, at the end of it, the normal rules didn't apply. Your, your, your number wasn't your number if you were the incumbent. And for the first time in a long time, we had the actual number of voters drop from the previous election, which is astonishing given how you know, this was the election in which everybody was enthusiastic, fired up, and ready to go. And yet we had so many more people, particularly working class whites in the industrial Midwest, who said, I can never bring myself to vote for Obama. I may have voted for him last time around, but um, I just I can't bring myself to vote for him. And I can't bring myself to vote for the you know, plutocrat with a wife who's an open practicing admitted equestrian. And uh, <laughs> that's Haley Barber's line, but I really love it. And I hate to have to credit the guy for it. But, but it's, were your assumptions about turnout or the mix mistaken in the end? Were you surprised by yeah, where was, the votes actually were? Yeah, I'm surprised. Look, uh, here's the, actually carry this document around. I got you a clean copy because you may want to steal it at the end so you can look really thoughtful. It was uh, prepared for me by my erstwhile assistant called Data Girl. Uh, there are 4.2 million fewer whites who turn out to vote in this election than voted four years ago. Uh, Latinos are up a million, 83. There are 300,000 fewer African Americans who turn out to vote. And there's a swing of a million African Americans out of the Obama column and into the Romney column or out of the electorate altogether. 600,000 fewer blacks vote for Obama and 323,000 more African Americans vote for Romney than voted for McCain. Uh, that's, a, that's pretty astonishing. I would have thought the opposite. And we talk a lot about Latinos and there were a million 83,000 more Latino votes, but there are 1,245,000 more Asian American votes, so, which we don't talk a lot about. Which broke much more, um, in much higher proportion to the Democrats than they have historically. Well, they, they, the, the Asian American vote, that's right, but it also the Asian American vote is also a, uh, a, a, an incumbent vote. Gore does better among them in 2000 than John Kerry does in 2004, and they do, uh, they, 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 don't, they do much better for Obama in 2012 than they do in 2008. They tend to vote for the incumbent party. But if you step up a level or two from the, from, the, from, from the data, what do you think went wrong? I mean, was Mitt Romney the wrong candidate? Um, was the problem the campaign? Or is there something deeper at work yeah. here? Well, it, no election can be blamed on one single thing. We always were like Curly in the, you know, whatever those movies were, you know, one thing. Uh, and uh, th that's not the way politics works. But if I had to pick a couple of things, this was a tactical victory. Uh, I thought it was really interesting in, uh, in, I think it was March, when Messina gave a ser series of interviews to Washington Post and others and described a critical moment in the Obama campaign. They go to the president in March and April of 2012 and say, you can't win on the basis of what you've done. We talk about the stimulus and people are turned off. We talk about the Affordable Care Act and people don't like it. You talk about the improving economy and they, it, it creates a counter reaction. You can't win on the basis of a prospective vision. We laid out the State of the Union address and we're three months later and nobody can remember a single thing out of the State of the Union address. So we have to make what Messina called the grand bet. We have to take a fifth of our campaign funds, $200 million, and go irradiate Mitt Romney during the summer. And it was a grand bet, they said, because if they didn't succeed by Labor Day in uh, knocking the underpinnings out from underneath him on the issue of the economy and his ability to turn around the country, then they wouldn't have money or time to try something else. And Obama greenlights it, and they spend time and they spend money, $200 million in the summer, irradiating Mitt Romney. And I think this was one of the critical moments, because Romney needed to defend Bain Capital, and he didn't. And uh, he needed to be out there, in my opinion, saying, you know, my experience in helping turn around companies like uh, the steel company in Indiana or Staples or you name it, uh, are skill sets that America needs to turn around its economy. And he didn't do it. We, we at Crossroads, I watched, we watched for three weeks while they assaulted Bain. And you can't talk to the campaigns directly. You can't coordinate with them, but you can play bridge. So after about three weeks, 
We said, look, this is, this is hurting. We think this is hurting. So why don't we signal to them? Why don't we bid one heart? And so we went out. There was a Washington Post editorial that excoriated the attacks on the Romney campaign by Obama, saying these are all phony, ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. So we, took, we made up an ad and ran the ad. Here's what the, even the liberal Washington Post says, Obama's attacks, blah, 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 blah. Why is Obama doing this? Because he's got a lousy record on the jobs and the economy. And Romney will do better. And we put it up, and it cost $9 million to put that up in 14 battleground states. But we're trying to signal to the Romney campaign, if you want to engage on this, you lead, we'll follow. Now, they can't talk to us, but they can talk to the press. And the press immediately would call us up and say, we just talked to the Romney campaign about your ad, and they say, um, first of all, issue's not hurting us, and B, in politics, if you're responding, you're losing. A lot of times in politics, if you're responding, you're winning, but we decided wrongly that they were right, and so we didn't proceed, and, but we should have. We should have found the young kid working at Staples who said, you know, I, I started out stocking shelves, and now I'm the manager, and I got a great life. And it's because Mitt Romney helped turn around this com company. And, you know, find the woman at the steel plant in Indiana who says, my dad worked in steel, my husband works in the steel, I work in steel, steel runs in our blood. We got 13,000 proud people working here, but this plan almost went under until Mitt Romney and Bain came in and used their money and their ideas to help turn it around, and he'll do the same for America. The other critical moment, I think, from the Romney campaign's perspective, and I don't mean to be criti to overly critical, because look, I've been through two of these, and it's really hard. You know, everything's easy in, in retrospect. But we needed to know more about Mitt Romney. We needed to know more about him and there's a natural reticence among too many candidates on the Republican side to share who they are. And I'll just give you two examples. Uh, the Oporoskis. Anybody watch the Republican convention on cable as opposed to the... The Oporoskis. They appeared not in prime time. Elderly couple. On the night that Romney was to give his speech, uh, Clint Eastwood was in prime time. The Oporoskis were not. Uh, 346 words, and when Mrs. Oporoski finished, I was in the I was there in the in the facility in Tampa, sitting this far away from Bill Bill O'Reilly. And when she finished speaking, I looked over to O'Reilly, and he was crying, as were most of the people in the arena. She said, "In 1978, our son David was diagnosed with leukemia. We went to the same church as Mitt, and Mitt began to visit David in the hospital, and they became quite close." David was uh, worried about what would happen to his uh, possessions when he passed, and he knew Mitt was a lawyer, and so he asked Mitt if he'd help him write his will. And so the next time Mitt came to the hospital, he came with a pad, and a, a yellow pad and a pencil, and together they wrote out David's will. David had two final requests. They'd be buried in his Boy Scout uniform, and then Mitt Romney pronounced the eulogy, and it was a beautiful eulogy. And how could you look at a man who would care so deeply about a dying boy and not know that he cared deeply about every American and would help, would care as much for America as he cared for David. And I mean, powerful. And I have to admit, the cynic in me said, fantastic. Isn't this going to be great? They're going to be out on the campaign trail. They're going to introduce him. There's going to be a TV ad. It's going to be great. Oh, fantastic. This is going to be just people are going to be so moved by this. Three weeks go by and nothing happens. So I find out how to get a hold of the Oporoskis and call them up. They live in Vermont. And I call him up, and he answers the phone, and he doesn't believe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is sort of weird. But anyway, I said, look, it, it, the Romney campaign, are you going to go campaign for me? He says, are you going to cut an ad? Have you done an ad? He said, we haven't heard from him since the convention. And I said, would you be willing to do an ad? And he said, yeah. We, I, let me talk. Well, first, he said, I need to talk to Pat, his wife, who's clearly the boss of the family. And uh, they, later that day, they said, this on a Saturday afternoon, they said yes. On Monday, we had a film crew up there. I took the 346 words, cut them down to about 142 so it could fit in a minute spot. And they shot the takes. And by the end of the week, we had a fantastic ad with the two of them sitting on a couch holding hands. And he said a little and she said a lot. And they basically repeated what they said at the convention, interspaced with pictures of their boy. And it's a powerful ad. It is an unbelievably authentic and sincere 
and I mean, you learn so much about Romney by listening to these people talk about him. And it cost us $14 million to put it up in, the, in, in, I think, 11 battleground states. But why were we doing it? The Romney campaign, in my opinion, should have been doing it. But, but, but some of these things just shouldn't have cost money. And I'll, I'll shut up and we can go on to the next question. This, to me, is this representative of the problem. Remember the London interview, the Olympic interview? This is where he got into trouble by turning into the TV commentator. You know, the security preparations here in London, or there's some criticism about Just the kind of thing that will piss off every Brit. And uh, so that's the whole controversy. But to me, the critical moment was they asked him about um, Raflika, the horse. Do you remember it? They say, okay, what about your, your wife has a horse running in the dressage here. What do you have to say about it? And he wants to get as far away from that as possible. He said, well, that's Ann's thing, and I won't even be here, and you know, let's go on to the next question. If some of you, like Joe Gildenhorn, I see sitting here, had, you've heard him talk about the horse in private. If he had said in public what he has occasionally said in private, imagine the moment. He's sitting there and gets asked that question. He says, you know what? I, I don't really care what happens here in London, and let me tell you why. Whatever number of years ago, 21 years ago, we had a death sentence pronounced on our family. My wife was diagnosed with MS, and I gotta tell you, it was the scariest moment of my life. Lose the love of my life, lose the mother of our children, of our boys, and I scared, I was really scared. This was, this, this was a horrible moment. And the doctors came along and said, you know, don't ask us why, we don't really understand why, but we have found with MS patients, if you get them up on a horse and they ride regularly, something happens to their vestibular system and it helps them fight off the disease. So Ann got a horse and got up on a horse and started riding, and here she is 21 years later, however many years later, and she's in fantastic health, and she's with us, and she's, we're enjoying our grandchildren together, and, I, and every day I wake up feeling blessed to be with the love of my life. So I don't care what happens here in London, because in the Romney household, we long ago awarded Reflika the gold medal. So I, I don't care what happens here. American people would have respond. Instead, it was like, hey, I'm a rich guy. You don't know that, and I'm going to quickly get away from it by saying, I don't have anything to do with that horse. And instead of telling us, <laughs> instead, of, instead of telling us how, how the story of how she ended up on a horse. And there's, we've now had two presidential candidates in a row, John McCain and Mitt Romney, both of whom for different reasons, one because of the, you know, the military upbringing and the other because I'm, I'm convinced because of who he is, a reticence to talk about who they are. And the problem is when you run for president, the American people want to know who you are. And it's not just where you are on you know, Senate Bill 454, it's who you are inside. And, and Romney didn't share who he was inside. I mean, this idea of you know, going to the hospital all the time to see a 14-year-old boy and develop a, as close a bond as he clearly had with his dying kid says something about Mitt Romney that people would find admirable and could, could explain so much of who he was and what he was capable of being. And the same with with the whole experience with Reflique, and instead we were left with the guy who had the garage for his cars at his La Jolla home. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, the elevator in his garage for his cars. I mean, it's a sad moment. Crossroads also put a lot of money into Senate races across the country, yeah. and you had a tough cycle mm -hmm. there. Um, one, two, lost a lot of other ones. Zillions. Zillions. <laughs> um, so what were those conversations with the donors like in the wake of the election, and how are you making the case to them now to get back into the pool and to reinvest? We, we have an incredible group of donors. One of them called me at 6 a.m. after the morning after the election. His first words were, beat him next time, kiddo. Our biggest donor said, I bet I, I make long-term investments, and I'm investing long-term with you. Our third biggest donor, I went to see him recently just to sort of brief him on, as we periodically do. He said, when are we going to get going? And I said, well, we'll be back to you this fall. He said, no, 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 let's get going now. I'm, I'll start with five million. These guys are sophisticated and gals are sophisticated, smart people who know that some elections you're going to win and some elections you're going to lose, and they want to they wanna place a bet on the elections to, with us to try and make, make things be better than they would otherwise be. And they have confidence because we're transparent in how we deal with them and we are uh, different. Uh, most of these super PACs are scams, many of them, too many of them. Uh, our cost of overhead in the last election was seven-tenths of one percent of the money we raised. 
our cost of legal compliance, accounting, and fundraising was less than seven tenths of one percent. We're the only group that I know of that doesn't pay a commission fundraisers. Most of our fundraising is done by, well, all of our fundraising is done by volunteers with a couple of staff people who support our phone calls. Uh, we don't pay the media guys 15%, we pay them 3%, working their way down to 2%. The more they do for us, whether you're a mail guy, internet guy, television guy, whatever, uh, your commission is 3% working its way down to 2%. So better than 95 cents out of every dollar we get goes onto the target. And we're transparent with our donors about it, and uh, they like it. I don't take a dime from the organization. I don't get any compensation, direct or indirect. In fact, I pay my own travel expenses. So when I go to Los Angeles and call on somebody and ask them for a million dollars, I don't want them worrying about how much money is going to end up in my pocket. And donors like that. And as a result, because we're con we tell them as we go along what's happening, uh, they tend not to have surprise. We had one guy who died this year. Gave us a lot of money. Gave us $7 million in 2012, uh, uh, 11 and 12. Died this year, 80 years old, died suddenly. He uh, set up a, he, he probably, he, he had a sense that something might be happening, so he set up a trust so that he could continue to give us money after he died. That's the kind of people we have involved. Is part of your pitch to them now, though, the, 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 that you, you're going to be involved? The Conservative Victory Project is what you're calling it, this new initiative to try to pick candidates, essentially. No, You've taken no a bit we're not, of a we're not, gonna, we're not within the party no. for, for doing this. Well, look, look I've taken, we've taken a beating from groups that are involved in choosing candidates like Murdoch and Aiken, and they don't want anybody else to be playing in their space. But if they get Meaning to play in Tea Party, no, 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 they're not Tea Party. They're not, they're not Tea Party. I mean, they're, you know, some of them are Tea Party, some of them are not. But the fact of the matter is, is we ended up, you know, one group spent $750,000 to nominate Murdoch in Indiana, and we spent $5.9 million in the general election to try and get him that sorry candidate across the finish line. And so what we've said is, if, we're, if, we're not, if we don't have a dialogue about this at the beginning, don't expect us to be there at the end. We're no longer going to be, you know, our rule before was we're not involved in primaries. Now we're going to be involved in primaries because we're sick and tired of put, being there to put up money for Sharon Angle and Ken Buck and, you know, and Murdoch. And we put $3.3 million into Missouri before the Republican primary. Uh, Claire McCaskill's numbers were so far down that there was no way in hell she could be defeated except we nominated a complete idiot, and we did. <laughs> Courtesy... Courtesy, incidentally, do you know who the largest spender in the Republican primary in Missouri in 2012 was? Harry Reid, who spent $2 million attacking Todd Aiken in the Republican primary, saying Todd Aiken is too conservative for Missouri. He has never supported a tax increase. He's voted consistently pro-life. He is so extreme, he's even backed a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Todd Aiken, too conservative for Missouri. I mean, this is like, you know, this is like crack cocaine to Republican primary voters. And uh, so basically we said with the Conservative Victory Project, we're going to, we, let's have a conversation about these candidates. And, if you, and, and if, you, if you nominate somebody and don't bother talking to us about it, and we're not part of the deal, then, 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 the, then the, the, the burden's on you. Don't expect us to be, don't count on us to come in and do your general election business after you finish the primary business if you're not willing to talk to us. I'll give you one example. Shelley Moore Capito in West Virginia is fantastic. Really terrific. Old political family, terrific member from Charleston, represents a swing district, wins huge, really terrific human being, really smart, really thoughtful. But she doesn't have the perfect vote record from the perspective of one of the groups. She's only got a 94% rating. So she jumps into the election, and they come out and say, we're going to support somebody else. And we go out of our way to say, we're going to support her. And then they start getting uh, interested in a candidate, a former House of Delegates member who says, I, I, I believe that we've, we're, our kids and our kid, grandkids are drowning in a world of debt, and we must step forward and save the country by, by reining in the spending in Washington. And this group that found her insufficient for not having a completely pure record says publicly, well, we're interested in talking to them further. So we go over and say, before you do that, boys, little research packet on the man you might want to look at. Because several years ago, he had to declare bankruptcy because his income was equal to one quarter of his spending. It was his own kids that were drowning under the sea of debt. His spending, his debt. 
I mean, that's the kind of stuff we need to do more of so we don't end up with as many of these candidates who simply can't win in a general election. I want to, I want to, um, you described a few minutes ago when I asked the question about what went wrong last time, a candidate in a campaign that didn't have great political reflexes in either case. I want to ask again about whether there's an underlying problem um, and, and how you would like the party to address it over the course of the next cycle if there is one. I mean, you made the point that Mitt Romney got more than 300,000 more black votes than John McCain did in the previous cycle, but he still relied on white voters for 90% of his votes. You and George W. Bush worked hard on, uh, with a goal of trying to broaden the base of the party. Um, but there's an emerging argument among Republicans now that actually that's not necessary, that, that simply increasing turnout among white voters will be enough to get the presidency back. Do you buy that argument, first of all? And, and second of all, what happens if the immigration if to the Republican Party doesn't matter if the immigration bill yeah. doesn't make it through the House? Well, on the first part of your question, there is a, I, I was having breakfast this morning, picked up the copy of the Wall Street Journal, and there's a brilliant piece today in the Wall Street Journal on this very I topic. That piece. I got to tell you, really, I did a hell of a good job with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my research assistant did. Uh, no, look, it's insufficient. I mean, the key, you know, if, if you know, this idea of all we got to do is get more of the white vote. Well, Romney got 59% of the white vote. Uh, he would have needed to carry 62.5% of the white vote of this year's turnout in order to have won the election by simply increasing his white vote. Well, Ronald Reagan got 63% of the white vote in 1984 when he was carrying 49 states. So it's, you, you can't get there routinely. You cannot routinely expect to get Ronald Reagan's numbers from a 49 state victory routinely for candidates. The other thing is, is that even if you do get a high number, it gives you a relatively smaller number of electoral votes. In 1988, 41, George H.W. Bush got 60% uh, of the white vote and got 426 electoral college votes. Uh, his son got 58% uh, of the white vote in 2004 and got uh, 286 electoral college votes. And the, the difference is, is that the percentage of the non-white vote has grown from 13% in 1984 to 28% in 2012, we're becoming a more diverse country. And that's gonna continue for a period of time. It's not a straight line. I love these guys who, who think that demography is just a straight line. I mean, we're already starting to see, for example, Hispanic birth rates taper off uh, because they're becoming more affluent and more middle class. And when people become more affluent and more middle class, they tend to have a smaller number of children. Uh, but nonetheless, the country's becoming more diverse and the Republican Party can and should do better among um, non-white voters. McCain got, uh, as you might expect, 3% of the African-American vote, and, and you can understand why. First African-American who had a serious chance of becoming president, and there's gonna be enthusiasm in the community for making that happen. What's interesting to me is that in 2012, Romney gets 11% of African-American men, which says something's going on there. But the key it, it, for the foreseeable future is to increase our turnout among whites. There were two, according to the Census Bureau, two million fewer whites. According to the exit polls, four million fewer whites. The actual number is somewhere in between. And those were basically white working class voters who couldn't, who couldn't vote for either candidate. We gotta do better at getting them. But we also have to do better and can do better and should do better and have a moral responsibility to attempt to do better among non-white voters, African Americans, Latinos, and uh, Asian Americans and other which I think includes Indians and Norwegian Americans and grumpy people. <laughs> I'm not telling you what I am, go to hell. Um, but, and we can. To me, the interesting thing is to be found in the Latino vote in 2012. Romney gets 27% of the Latino vote nationwide. In the seven battleground states with exit polling, he gets 32. And in the battleground of battleground, Ohio, where if you're running for president, it's like running for governor in a very long campaign in a medium-sized state. 
He got 42. 42. Now, part of that might be the sample size, because you're talking about a relatively, you know, 10% of the total sample in, in the state, less than 10%. But nonetheless, what it says to me is, is that in Ohio, it's a bit of evidence that in Ohio, you know, they heard so much about Romney's economic message that they finally got past the idea that this was the guy who said self-deport and beat up, Mitt, uh, beat up uh, Rick Perry for the Dream, Texas DREAM Act. I think they got past that and said, all right, I'm, I'm sick of that. I've heard so much about this other stuff. The economy is the number one issue to me. He's the better guy for the economy. If we, if we consistently got 42% of the Latino vote, uh, America would be like Texas. We routinely get 40% of the Latino vote in Texas, and we're a deep red state. I mean, you go to Corpus Christi, Texas, and the county courthouse is Republican with a bunch of Hispanic Republicans as the DA and the sheriff and so forth. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a cultural difference that, that, uh, that the Republican Party had better work at overcoming. So does it matter if the immigration bill doesn't make it through the house? Yeah, it does matter. Uh, I don't know how much, but it does matter. Uh, the problem in the, in the House is that 148 members of the House are Republicans with less than 10 percent Hispanics in their district. And so, they, they, you know, they're, they're not like, I think it's interesting, one of, the, one of the interesting things is 2006 and 7, as we were working on this bill, 2005, 6, and 7, I used to have a lot of, of uh, let's say, heated conversations with a Texas congressman named John Carter, who I've known for a long time. He's the, he was the first Republican county official in Williamson County, the suburban county north of Austin, which used to be sort of redneck Democrat territory. And in 1981, he was appointed the judge, who literally the first Republican in the county courthouse. Today, I, 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 there's not a single countywide elected official who's a Democrat. I think they got like one constable and one JP. Uh, and it's, but he was, he was a hard ass on immigration. And in the intervening time, he sort of worked through the problem, and he's now one of the members of the Gang of Eight in the House trying to find a way to comprehensive immigration reform. And it's because the growing Hispanic nature of his district, he, it's not like he's now threatened, but he's sitting there saying, I know these people. You know, I, 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 they're my neighbors. They're my constituents. It's the small business guy I meet with. It's the veteran who needs his help on his veteran's retirement, the single mom who needs help getting her benefits for her child. And he, and he suddenly, the, this, it's caused him to start interacting with the community in a way that says, no, let's find a rational answer to this. Let me open it up to you guys. Yes, sir. Now, I think there are mics making their way around somewhere. Um, but let's not wait for them. So yeah. why don't you shout it out. stand we'll up and shout it out. Here, sorry, here comes a the mic. They figured out where all of, thank you. <laughs> it is said that the Democrats had a big data processing center in Chicago and that they had a huge amount of data. They knew who was going to vote, who wasn't going to vote, how they were going to vote, and it enabled them to develop a strategy to bring out the vote of the people they wanted in the places they wanted. Did, uh, one, is that true from your perspective? And two, are the Republicans going to yeah. do something like that in the next election? Yeah, look, uh, this is uh, very much true. Um, the Democrats uh, mimicked what the Republicans did on micro-targeting. Republicans have perfected this and probably do it better than the Democrats do, but the Democrats attempted to close the gap by taking up to in the Republican case, they use up to 450 pieces of household level information about you in order to develop three numbers. How likely are you to vote? How persuadable are you? And then a complex algorithm for every voter and non-voter, everybody registered and everybody unregistered, that describes your view of the world. What, what's important to you? How do you think about things? What will motivate you? They do it. We do it. We probably do it better than they do because we've got 12 years' experience in doing it. However, there's a fatal flaw. There's a flaw, not a fatal one, but there's a flaw in how the Republicans do it. And that is they take that snapshot, they do all that computer work in May, June, or July, and they take a snapshot of the voters and hope that that snapshot holds until November. The Democrats said, that's not good. Let's set up our file in a different way and do our polling in a different way 
so that anytime we want to, we can push the button and dynamically retarget. It's called dynamic micro-targeting. So five days after the first debate, we do a gigantic poll, and we push the button, and we say, ah, these are the individual households who are likely to be at risk of turning off because Obama did so poorly in the first debate. Ah, a few weeks after he puts the executive order on the DREAM Act out, let's push the button, and it tells us what kind of his Latino households are now more open to voting for Obama. If you're Puerto Rican, you don't care. If you're Filipino American, you don't care. If you're Central Americans, you care a little bit. If you're certain kinds of Mexican Americans, you're now far more open to voting for Obama. So they, did, they set up it to do my dynamic micro re retargeting. The other thing that they did that's really impressive is, and, is, and they're sort of explicit about it, at these conferences post-election, they sort of, if you read between the lines, they say, look, we know the Republicans were gonna have a bigger get out the vote operation than we were because they have more volunteers and the Republicans will have a higher quantity of contacts between them and their target voters. We need to beat that by having better quality. Let's aim for a higher quality of contact. So they set it up so that they took all of their donors, and remember, he has five million donors, many of whom gave him three and five and ten dollars, and a, every one of their volunteers, and let's micro-target them as well. So we get those three set same numbers. Then let us ask them if we can sweep their address books, and let's tag everybody on the file who they know. And then let's sweep their social networks so that we know who's on their Facebook page and whose Facebook page they visit, whose Twitter feed they follow, whose LinkedIn network they're part of, and so forth. And let's tag all of that. So James is a target voter here. And Joe Gildenhorn is the volunteer. And we find out that Joe knows James. Well, we also find out that Mary knows him and Bob knows him. And so we have social scientists trying to figure out out of Mary, Bob, and Joe, who's going to be the most influential person talking to James. Now, if nobody knows James among our volunteers, then we want to find a similar bespeckled bald guy who thinks like James, who, who lives near James, and assign him as the volunteer to go get James. Now, this is called CRM, Customer Relationship Management, and they did it. Now, why do I know this much about it? Because I'm determined that we go out and beat their sorry asses into the ground in the same way. <laughs> and we have a group of, of nerdniks out of Silicon Valley led by one of the chief engineers for Facebook who's just become the chief technology officer at the Republican National Committee and a data trust and a group of Silicon Valley guys led by Dick Boyce, a managing partner at TPG, are raising the money to do this. And Crossroads is going to put up $2 million to help get them started. And we're going we're gonna to do it. Now, what's the effect of all of this? This is one of the interesting things in politics. What's the effect of all of this? There's an interesting study. It's preliminary, done by a couple of political scientists, in which they tried to figure out the relative effects of the get-out-the-vote operations on either side. And they, what, what they did is they looked at the 38 media markets in the country in battleground states that slop over into non-battleground states. So like Cincinnati, where if you buy TV ads in Cincinnati, they're seen by people who live 10 miles away in southeast Indiana, and people who live one mile south in northern Kentucky. So what they're trying to look at is what's the effect of the ground game on turnout? And so they looked at these markets. Omaha, Nebraska reaches Omaha, and further west in Nebraska, not a battleground state, but it also reaches far western Iowa, and so forth. There are 38 of these media markets. Everybody in those media markets sees the same amount of TV ads, so any differences in turnout are, are likely to be a result of the ground game. And they found that turnout was 4.5% higher in the, in the battleground state portion of the media markets than in the non-battleground portions, and that Obama got 1.6% greater turnout among Democrats, 1.6 points more turnout among Democrats than Romney got among Republicans. And so I say the advantage he had was 1.6% and the time is erase it. Now, this isn't enough to win the election. Take 1.6% off of, of Obama's total and add 1.6% onto Romney's and, you, and we still lose, but we win Florida, we win Virginia, we come very close in Ohio, and we come very close in Colorado and New Hampshire. And if you have other changes like Oporowski's and Reflika, we might have been able to win it. But next time around, this has got to be one of the part of the components to, to victory. Let's take a note, sir, sir, can we?
give somebody else yeah, a shot. Yeah, they, they, Bob's point was they'll be better than last time around, and the fact is we'll be better than they will have been. Yeah. Um, can we go back there, please, in the, in the, in the, on the aisle in the white shirt? Taking you back to the Bush White House, I'm just wondering, is there, knowing what you know today, is there anything that you would have done differently or would have um, taken back? Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, that's, the great, that's the great ability of hindsight. The problem is you have to make the decisions in the environment you make them in. I mean, would, would, should we have landed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and, and, gotten in a, and gotten in a car and gone down to New Orleans? Yeah. You know, should we have done other things differently? Yeah, but I mean, that, unfortunately, you don't get to, except on, you know, in the Wayback Machine on, uh, on Bullwinkle, you don't get to go back in time. Can we go over there? Is that too far for the mic to? Yeah, well, the microphone is en route. Has Al Hubbard arrived? No, okay. Can turn up. Over here, please. Thank you. I'm really loud, so I was about to start signing or shouting, but the mic got here. So um, I write a lot about African-American issues and African-American Republicans in particular. And I wanted to know if, and I'm sorry if, if you already covered this. I was a little late because of a deadline. Um, if you think the Supreme Court's voting rights decision will end up having a beneficial impact on the Republican Party in local elections. And the second part of that, is there the potential also for a national backlash in terms of minority turnout on the other side, which we kind of saw with some of the um, voter ID laws. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think it'll have big consequences in local elections, and I, I don't think there'll be a big backlash. I think it's gonna be, you know, look, uh, the idea that there are 13 uh, states in the old Confederacy that somehow or another are still bastions of racism is, I, I think, ridiculous in our age. and. Uh, uh, Bush did sign the renewal of this specific provision uh, because Congress passed it, but we were dubious about it, its necessity. And I think it is right that we treat every state in the union the same with regard to its election laws. We don't require you know, um, states in the middle, Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic or the West Coast to pre-clear their uh, election law changes with the federal government. I don't think we need to in the old states of the Confederacy, particularly where we've seen uh, a dramatic increase in uh, minority, non-white turnout, non-white registration. Another question. Right here in front, please. Sorry, making you guys yeah. run around. Yeah, why don't, why don't we give her the microphone and then why don't you call on the next person and she can pre-position the yeah. microphone. Let's see another question. Okay, we've got a very eager, the yeah. next one will be. Right there. Right in the, on the aisle in the back there, please. Hi. So I, I just have a question. I, I hear, I mean, this politics is very competitive. Statistics really? and yes, <laughs> and, and, and I'm just wondering. I mean, what would be your top two things that you see needs to be done to be more collaborative, more cooperative? Because Democrats are going to win, yeah. Republicans are going to win, but we still have to be collaborative, and it just yeah. feels so competitive. Uh, you know, there are two things. One of which is actually underway. Um, I had a really interesting experience with uh, Boehner in March of 2010. I'm sitting at home in Austin, and I get this phone call on a Saturday afternoon about 12, 12.30. They said, is there any way you could, where, where are you? I said, I'm in Austin. They said, can you get to Dallas by 5? Uh, I said, yeah, I can go out to the airport and get on a Southwest flight. Why? They said, Boehner is in Dallas for a fundraiser tomorrow, and there's nobody to have dinner with him. <laughs> this was the, turned out this was the 65th birthday of this gigantic Texas oilman in Dallas who was having the complete blowout at his ranch with the Eagles performing and Billy Joel and anybody who was anybody in Dallas is out at his ranch. And Boehner has arrived and he's going to be arriving there and he has nobody to have dinner with. So I go to the airport, I get on a plane, fly up there. In the meantime, they've located Matt Rose, the head of uh, Burlington Northern Resources over in Fort Worth, and his wife come over and the three of us have dinner with Boehner at a little steakhouse near the airport. Boehner's stepping out every 10 minutes to have a smoky treat and uh, glass of red wine. Matt Rose is a really earnest guy, and so we're having a conversation. Eventually, Matt says to Boehner, out of nowhere, he says, what's wrong with the House? I mean, what is wrong with Congress? Why is it so dysfunctional? And Boehner turns philosophical. And I mean, it was a really incredibly revealing answer. He said, the problem is the House of Representatives, only five people matter. 
Speaker, Majority Leader, Majority Whip, Chairman of the Rules Committee, and Chairman of the Subject Matter Committee, and nobody else matters. He said it happened under Democrats and it's happened under Republicans, and it's not the way the House is supposed to operate. This is not how, for 200 years, the Constitution and precedent have said the House should operate. The House should operate by having bills start at the subcommittee level and work their way up and have to go through all of that and hearings and work and negotiations and people talking to each other and then brought to the floor and voted upon and considered and sometimes rejected. I mean, he said the, the, it shouldn't find people sitting in the back room shouldn't say, well, we're going to do a health care bill and we'll write it and we've got to pass the bill so we know what's in it. And he said the byproduct of doing it the way that we're doing is, is that we become intensely partisan and there's no conversation at the subcommittee or committee level, and these people don't feel like they have to work with each other. All they got to do is keep their respective camp in line, and that's it. And, and I thought it was really revealing because Boehner is operating that way. I mean, he's not going to write the immigration bill. He's saying to the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee, you guys go write it. And, you know, it, it took us 20 years to get, or 30 years to get into this pattern. It's going to take us time to get out of the pattern, but I think it's one of the two things that needs to happen. The other thing that needs to happen is that we need to have a president who will sit down and talk with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle on a regular, routine basis. When you get a, I, I, this will shock you, I talk to Democrats. <laughs> I will not destroy their reputations by mentioning their names publicly. <laughs> but if you think Republicans are harsh in their view of the president and his relationship with Congress, you should talk to some Democrats. One of them went out and talked here recently. Peters, this new guy from California, says the president completely disengaged. I mean, a Democrat senator told me, he said, God, Bill, Obama did a great thing, invited a bunch of people down to see the Super Bowl. He said, I got to shake his hand and be said, told to go to the back of the family theater, and that's the last I saw him. He sat up front the entire time. I mean, look, like it or not, you got 100 senators and 435 members of Congress, and this is an intensely personal arena, and you need the ability to have the president engage and, and reach across party aisles. I, I, I was once with a rank, with a significant, at that point, uh, current serving member of the White House, who said to me, I was really surprised that we didn't get more Republican support on the stimulus. I said, really? You know, did you ever talk to him? He said, no. I said, did you, go, did you ever go up there and seriously contemplate getting elements of the Republican suggestions about the stimulus and swapping out something that you had in your package for what they had in there? He said, no. I said, were you there when the president told Cantor, who's been deputized to lay out the Republican suggestions about the stimulus, when the president cut him off by saying, I won? He said, yeah. I said, you didn't see anything wrong with that? He said, well, we won. Well, we won in 2000. And in June, in a slightly more contentious election, you may remember, <laughs> a little thing called Florida. I mean, we had, we had Democrats who never believed Bush was the president, many of them located here in Pitkin County. <laughs> And yet by June, with a Democrat-controlled Senate, we had passed the Bush tax cuts, with a quarter of the Democrats voting for it, because Bush sat down and negotiated. You don't want it to be a trillion seven, you want it to be a trillion three. You don't want the top rate to be 33, you want it to be 35. You want to take the money freed up by moving that top rate to 35 and use it on the bottom end to take people off of the tax rolls altogether. Eight million people taken off the tax rolls altogether. You want to do this in such a way that it has a 10-year expiration, is not permanent? I mean, you think we wanted to do all of those things? But we did, because that's how the process is supposed to work. And, and, and it works when you are engaged in that kind of involvement. And this president is not engaged. He's not engaged personally, and nor is his White House engaged in this kind of give and take, whether it's Republicans or Democrats. We're getting the hook, but I, I yeah. owe one more question up here, please. Better make it a good one. Yeah. Can the, can the Republicans win without the women's vote, and can... You get the women's vote if you're so attached to the right to life yeah. issue. Yeah, first of all, the, the, women's, the focus on the women's vote last time around by Obama was a defensive measure, not an offensive measure. He was worried about losing it. And so he went, he made this war on women, ma'am, because he was worried about losing. 54% of white women voted for Romney. Romney got a fine number among women. Could have done a point or two better, but got an acceptable number. Uh, the more the race is about the economy, the better off he was. But, but look, this abortion issue 
you got to be really careful about this because this is an issue. The, uh, Ralph Reed once told me something that I think is absolutely right. First person to talk about it in a campaign generally loses. Republicans were the first ones to talk about this, courtesy of journalists in the Republican primary debates and courtesy of stupid voices in Congress standing up saying stupid things about the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act. But this is a weird issue, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in years ahead. For example, millennials, 18 to 29-year-olds, they are the most fervent in favor of a woman's right to choose. A woman ought to have the right to choose, no ifs, ands, or buts. They also, among all the age cohorts, are the part of the electorate that is most likely to deem more, uh, abortion morally wrong in all instances. That's a pretty harsh view, morally wrong in all instances. 52% of millennials carry, carry that view. So, you know, if you have a Republican candidate who stands up and says, I'm running for president to end abortion, good luck with that. On the other hand, if you have a Republican pro-life president who says, I'm pro-life, I recognize the Supreme Court has said that abortion shall be legal in America, so what can we do to, as wherever, regardless of where you are on this issue, what can we do to, 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 to provide alternatives to abortion, like adoption, or make certain that parents are involved in the decisions of their teenage daughters. That's a winning message, I know, because it was a, a, a guy who said that twice won the presidency as a Republican. But the issue is one that's got to be, it's a, it's a lot more nuanced. I would love for Democrats to go out and say, by God, I'm running for governor, I'm running for president because I am defiantly in favor of abortion. Because that's as, as, as bad an issue a bad an approach is somebody saying, by God, I'm running because I'm for governor or president because my, my goal is to end abortion. Either one of those things is not exactly the best way to introduce yourself to the voters. All right, so we end on a note of some potential middle ground, I guess, on a tough issue. So thank you very much. Okay. Safe, legal, and rare, basically. Right? Pardon? Safe, legal, and rare. Yeah.